<laughs> Bill, are you are you slash were you a skier? Uh, not a good one. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, and I went with my kids, and for a while, um, I had more momentum than they did, but it didn't that didn't last long. Um, they overtook me, and they are both dazzling skiers, and oh, wow. uh, and so are my grandchildren. Five grandchildren, they all ski like crazy. I did cross country skiing, and I loved it. I I can't do it anymore because I'm not um, my balance isn't good enough, and but um, I think that's absolutely wonderful sport and i credit the university for developing and adding to the development of that sport uh it's really come up in the time i've been here you know it's like the turkeys came back and, and uh <laughs> the wolves came back and cross-country skiing developed and there's lots of good things that's happened here I um, have been cross. I, I wasn't. I took a few pictures that I wasn't didn't have enough time today to put them in the slide deck. But um, we're all we're skiing out there cross country now. There's enough snow on the ground. Erica, maybe you can look up how much snow we've had so far. But uh, in my backyard, I think I have about a foot. I mean, and they've been ro they've rolled the trails a few times already. So we, we they haven't put the grooves in. But I I usually I have um like rough cross-country skis that are a little bit wider than normal because I don't like it when they're so slippery. And so I, I, I that's what I use when I go cross-country skiing. And I'm usually, I'm not even in the tracks because my skis are too wide. But um, we were out both days and I realized how much strength it takes that I've lost across the year. And I, I exercise, you know, I bike and stuff, but those, like whatever's going on in your, you know, in your torso that keeps you balanced and keeps Keeps you able to, man, I was like, I need to add an exercise to my routine to, to get, to keep me fitter. <laughs> you all do. It's fun. It's fun. We, so we have the two dogs and my husband, um, he attaches them, um, on a harness to his, um, around his waistband or, or hips. And he's good enough at skiing that when they pull him this way or that way, he can stay on his feet. And, but he gets, um, propelled forward by this and I'm slogging along behind you know just trying to just just trying to you know get to get through the course and I'm not good enough to have the dogs pull me along but uh anyway that was kind of what I did this weekend both Saturday and Sunday so awfully fun all right so we are going to we're coming up on the hour and I um I'm trying to remember how to introduce you Erica and so you, where did you graduate from? I've forgotten completely. I went. There, I got it. Dal Dalhousie yeah. University. Yeah, okay. All right. I will, I'm going to give a brief introduction. And you're going to have to add to it. Okay. <laughs> Sounds just fine. It's been one of those days. Oh, my gosh. So, um. Yeah, so um, we're coming up on the hour, and uh, I just want to um, begin by um, welcoming everybody to Husky Bites. You could see um, that uh, we've got um, uh, Bill Rose as our major speaker here, and Erica Vai as the co-host. Um, uh, and and Erica will be, will be introducing Bill in a moment, but uh, um, before that, I just want to um, share my own screen and hopefully uh, share some slides. And this is the one I want to share. I don't have much to present here. That was not what I wanted. All right, we want this one to go away. All right, so welcome to Husky Bites, everyone. And what is Husky Bites? It's a, an opportunity to learn something new um, on Monday nights uh, during the sort of fall or spring season. My name is Janet Callahan, and my role at Michigan Technological University is that I am Dean of the College of Engineering. 
And uh, so welcome everybody. Uh, and I, I wanted to, to let you know, and these, I actually took um, several days ago, a week ago, I took these pictures. We've had some snow begin to accumulate uh, and it's even more than this now. Um, and uh, it's beautiful. Um, we were talking about how much we love winter here and I love winter here. I think it's beautiful. I love snow. I've always loved snow. And I, I, I do, um, I, I do embrace the, um, the four, the four seasons. So welcome to Husky Bites. I wanted to let you know what our spring lineup is. Um, I believe spring will be season seven, if I'm counting correctly. Uh, and so we will begin, mark your calendars, January 23rd, we'll be featuring Mont Ripley. Uh, and then we'll be um, learning from Jeffrey Thompson, who is one of our own graduates in mechanical engineering, um, from whose business is Shaggy's Copper Country Skis. We're gonna be learning about making skis. We're gonna um, then go into some geospatial imagery um, through the Department of Geos, through the um, Program of Geospatial Engineering, which is in the Department of Civil, Environmental, and Geospatial Engineering with Joe Foster. And we're gonna have a student chapter co-hosting. Then we're gonna dig it with volleyball at Michigan Tech with um, our head coach volleyball, Matt Jennings, and co-host uh, uh, Jen Jung, which is her name when she attended here. Uh, and also it'll be the senior captain of volleyball. Solar energy will be next. Uh, and um, Anna is one of our amazing uh, faculty members in mechanical engineering, engineering mechanics. We're gonna be spending some time learning about money um, with uh, host Dean Johnson, College of Business and co-hosts will be the applied portfolio management program students. We will then take spring break off March 6th. Um, and then we resume hearing from our beloved Tony Rogers, um, who is the lead faculty member from chemical engineering for the consumer product manufacturing group. And there will be students involved in that. Bio-inspired designs out of biomedical engineering with Dr. Bruce Lee and his PhD student, um, John Jasek, who is the museum director for the AE Seaman Museum, which was an alumnus, such a, uh, alumna and alumnus um, suggestion. Uh, it's their 120th year anniversary uh, with co-host Patrice uh, Cobbin, who is the museum manager. And then we're gonna close it out with our last one of the season as the birds begin to come back to town with bird watching uh, uh, and quality of life with David Flashpuller. So that's our spring lineup. Um, I wanted you to know it this in advance. And um, I'm not sending out a mass mailing because it's really, really expensive, but I will be sending um, a holiday card. And uh, if, you partic if you in particular want me to send you this and you just tuned in tonight and it was your first time ever joining us, let me know by just sending me an email to callahanmtu.edu. And those of you who have been joining two or more times this spring, we're gonna, I think we're gonna send you a holiday card anyway. Thank you Husky Bites team, Sue Hill, Kim Geiger and Danielle Davis. Um, I don't know if you know it, but we write a blog about every single um, event. Uh, and so there's a beautiful blog that's been written up um, uh, 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 that I hope you you read. So if you wanna, if you wanna learn a little bit more about um, the speakers tonight, you can go and, and look on the blog. Uh, so, and with that, I'm going to just thank the entire audience for being with us for so long. Uh, and I wish you a very, just really um, thankful holiday. Um, it is um, the Thanksgiving week, the students have gone home. I wish you um, peace. Uh, I wish you um, prosperity. I wish I wish you um, blessings in, in as we close out 2022 and enter a new year. All right, and so I'm going to stop sharing, and Erica, you can start sharing. Uh, and I'm going to give a, a brief introduction to Erica because I'm a little discombobulated here with pieces of paper. Erica, I just met last week. Uh, Erica has known um, our our wonderful Dr. Bill Rose for a very long time. Uh, Erica Vi um, grew up on the east coast of Canada, just outside of Halifax, Nova Scotia. Uh, and as she says in her words, she's moved from one beautiful peninsula to another. Um, her parents and some of her still live there, and she has other family in New York City. Um, she started her undergraduate studies at Dalhousie University in the theater department, which I was interested to learn. She needed a science elective, and that's how she fell into geology. I think that's great. That's how I fell into material science and engineering. 
Um, she's fascinated by the ways rocks and landscapes share stories about the Earth's history, providing as a window to learn about deep time and how our geological geologic underpinnings are the foundation for our sense of place and our identity. We are all connected by our relationships with, with geology. And with that, Erica, I, I probably didn't say enough about you, but I'm going to turn it over to you to take it from here. Thank you so much, uh, Janet. Can everyone see the slides? Is, is everything showing OK? OK. All right, we'll take it away. Well, I want to say thank you very much for sharing this space and for inviting us to be here this evening. And also a huge thank you to the Husky Bites team. Uh, if anybody has not looked at any of the blogs on your site, they are spectacular. They're personable, they're warm and heartfelt. And so we really appreciate the time that goes into putting these kind of things together. So thank you for, for all your work on doing that. Um, so my name is Erica Bai. I'm a geosciences research scientist at the Great Lakes Research Center, and I'm also part of the University Indigenous Community Partnership Program, which is also housed at the Great Lakes Research Center. And something that I'm, I'm really passionate about is education and, and working with youth. And so I, I'm also very, very fortunate to be able to work a lot with our K-12 teachers and audiences um, through the work we do with the Lake Superior Stewardship Initiative here, here in our region. And so tonight, it is my absolute pleasure and an honor to be able to present Bill Rose, who's going to be sharing some really fun and interesting Keweenaw Geo stories, things that you might have thought you knew a little bit about the Keweenaw, but you're going to learn a whole lot more about how geology has influenced people um, through time. And so Bill and I have been working for about a decade on something we call geo heritage. Uh, we work with numerous community partners uh, to advance this in our area because we feel the Keweenaw has a really rich and meaningful geo heritage. Oh, I'm going to try to advance my slides here. So before we hand things over to Bill, I uh, just wanted to share a little bit about what we mean by geo heritage and uh, a little bit of background on some of the things that we've been doing for the past 10 years. Uh, but first, to acknowledge that this, the Keweenaw region, this spectacular place geologically, uh, is acknowledged as the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands and waters of numerous indigenous nations, uh, including the Anishinaabe. And that's the, the Three Fires Confederacy of Ojibwa, Ottawa, and Padawanamay peoples. And they're more than human relatives. So all beings that call these lands and waters home and have shared rights and responsibilities um, within this place. And so, as I mentioned, we have a really rich and deep geo heritage in our place. The world class geology that we have here, the lake and copper, are these collective elements that have really shaped the passage of people through our place, influence movement and industry and our identity. So, as, as you mentioned in the introduction, we all have these profound relationships with our landscapes. And of course, our geo heritage changes from place to place, depending on what your geology is you'll have a different, different sense of things um, in those places. So further thinking about our geoheritage, the Keweenaw is defined by this billion year old geology, these geologic processes that were at the heart of something called the Mid-Continental Rift System. And we could talk about that for hours, but we don't have a lot of time to do that. But we're just gonna say it's a big crack in the earth that we had massive outpourings of magma onto the surface of the earth, oceans of magma, and the rocks and landscapes that were created because of these processes have really shaped a place of superlatives. So these rocks and the landscape, they hold Lake Superior and they host the largest known copper deposit on earth and have created some of the largest known lava flows on, on the planet, the Greenstone lava flow, uh, for example. And so we have some images up on the screen. If you're, if you're listening, we have some images that um, show like four rock piles and Sand sands, and a lot of you uh, studied here, spent a lot of time here, probably poked around a poor rock pile, looked at copper at some point. Uh, but it's very apparent that there are relationships with geology um, when, when people visit this area, when they come to this place, and some of those relationships are more apparent. But there's been a number of different ways people have interacted with this landscape over years. This geo heritage is very rich. So we have the oldest metal workings in the Western Hemisphere, thinking about 7,000 years of copper mining. Um, the Anishinaabe Nation and how they have incorporated copper into their value system, trading copper up and down the Mississippi, using copper in ceremony today, and then more commonly described as that European immigration, uh, the copper boom uh, that people are more familiar with. 
And now as we move from an extractive past, we think about sustainable opportunities that will help us um, uh, with economic opportunity rooted in geotourism or ecotourism or conservation of our place, quality of life. So this is sort of the background of, of geoheritage in our place. And as I mentioned in the introduction, Bill and I have been working on this together for over a decade. And a few of our values or sort of objectives in this work is, is to think about how can we help broaden earth science literacy among the people that, that we uh, have in our communities and to be able to interpret geologic features and landscapes, not just through the lens of Western geoscience, but also thinking about traditional knowledge and other ways of knowing about landscape and demonstrating the value of geoheritage in our place through designations like UNESCO geoparks or national marine sanctuaries that help us foster resiliency within our community and opportunities for our place. And then promoting stewardship and these deepened relationships with landscape. And this is all built on a, a large number of community partnerships that, that have been built over time. So that's just to give some, some idea of some of the work that we've been doing over the past few years. And so I wanna hand it over to Bill, who's going to be our presenter this evening and share some of these amazing geo stories. And of course, Bill has a really long and illustrious career as, as a world famous uh, volcanologist. He started Dartmouth College, and has been at Michigan Tech for over 50 years and has worked with so many students. And it's, it was really beautiful at the beginning seeing all of these different students that are here to hear Bill this evening because they, they want to hear some more stories from Bill. Um, and so you're in for a treat for sure. But that was one of the, the things that I found so interesting and what attracted me to work with Bill initially is his passion for working with educators this idea of being able to encourage people to learn and to learn about their place, the concept of public scholarship, to think how can we bring people and geology together in a way that's meaningful. Um, and and GeoHeritage is, is a way to do that. And so part of this work more recently has been the development of these, these really fun geo stories that there are some recordings online. We'll have a chance to put some of those in the chat a little bit later, but you're going to get to hear some of those live and in person with Bill this evening. So I'm going to hand it over to Bill and we're really glad that you're, you're going to share these. So thank you. Okay, well, um, what I wanted to say is that when, when I was working at Michigan Tech and trying to get promoted and make a bigger salary and that kind of stuff. I concentrated on my work in classes and the research work, which was mostly done also by students. So it was all my day-to-day -day interaction with Michigan Tech students. And I love that part. I got to know people. They kept me younger than I would have felt otherwise. And uh, so they were continually wonderful. But one of the things I did is I ignored my neighbors. I I hardly even knew my next door neighbor. And uh, so I slowly became ashamed of that kind of behavior and tried to talk to the neighbors and the local uh, residents, the person who worked in the um, the supermarket and the person who uh, ran the bank and uh, all kinds of people and they're all around here but they're kind of separated for us sometimes from our life at, at Michigan Tech so I tried to get better and what I realized was that most of the local residents don't know as much geology as they want to know they're very, very receptive to being taught things about the geology. And so uh, that started to be feel really good to me. And uh, so when I retired, I decided I wanted to do that all the time. And so we came across this word called geoheritage and the students who were interested in it, especially Erica, and uh, so we started uh, outreach activities 
field trips, um, um, lectures, um, outdoor displays. Uh, we collected big rocks and moved them around where people could see them uh, more easily. We initiated work with artists at geological sites. We um, initiated music concerts, like the concert in the mine at the Delaware Mine. And there's good interaction with the University of Michigan that Libby Meyer has sustained uh, in a beautiful way. So now music in the mines is part of a regular activity. And that's exactly what we wanted to do is to help people um, get an idea of how to use our local geo heritage as a way to sustain a business. And so we're hopeful that all kinds of businesses, uh, boat tours, um, there already is substantial kayaking that uses geological inputs, um, of course, mountain biking. Um, but um, it's, so it's been really wonderful. And so this latest effort that I wanted to talk about today, these geo stories, um, it really comes about knowledge of history. So I was thinking that um, I was in Calumet. I love to go to Calumet. Um, such a rich place to see geo heritage. And, uh, but I would talk to people like in Shooty's Bar or um, in the Michigan house. And um, they were the same as my neighbors. They were curious about geology. But there was a lot that they didn't know. For example, a lot of them, even living in Calumet, they didn't know that Red Jacket, which is a big part of Calumet, the, the kind of mining center, and that's where the theater is. And uh, so, but the, even people that lived there didn't know that it had been mined out underneath them, that there was a layer of copper rich material that was extracted from the ground. And there was, so there's like a hole. That's a long uh, tabular hole at maybe 20 feet thick that goes all the way down to more than 5,000 feet below the surface, way below the bottom level of, of Lake Superior and all the way across town from the high school, um, all the way across town almost to Centennial. And so it's a, it's a fantastic thing to realize that. And the fact that a lot of people, even people that lived in Calumet, didn't know that that was there, that told me something. And I, and I said, I got to figure out a way to outreach farther uh, to people. And so, so what I'm working on now, and I just sort of started it, and I don't know if I want to keep doing it because I don't know if these things do what I hope they do, but I call them geo stories, and they're things about the Copper Country history, the Keweenaw history, that are fascinating, and which maybe people don't know enough about. And so I, maybe I could turn them on to this by telling a story. And so um, that's that's the kind of idea that um, we started out with. I mean, maybe what we could do is try some of these questions. We made up some questions for the group. And, um, they, and so here it is, uh, our first question. So Isle Royal is part of the Keweenaw. Um, pick your pick your answers in this case, and um, 
Well, and I'm going to read it out in case some people are listening. So one of our forefathers is given credit for Isle Royale being in Michigan. Who was it? A, Martha Washington, B, John Adams, C, Aaron Burr, D, Benjamin Franklin, and E, Thomas Jefferson. So very so, presidential. So how do we decide? Uh... All right. So the audience is coming in strongly on the um, Benjamin Franklin slash Thomas Jefferson uh, angle, and it's it's a tie at 36%. So I bet you one of those is the right answer. Yeah. The, uh, are we ready for the right answer? Or? Yes. Anyway, um, well, it's it's Benjamin Franklin. And oh. And Benjamin Franklin, I discovered, I, I looked into him a bit, and he is an outstanding personality, a wonderful, um, amusing, and um, holistic sort of person, of course, a great inventor and um, uh, that's what he was known for, these lightning experiments. He loved electricity and did all kinds of incredible experiments with this. He had a fascinating life. He got tired of living in America. And so he got a job as a, a foreign minister who could live in Paris. And he <laughs> loved the Paris lifestyle. And he attempted to do his job in Paris for the U.S. He was a, a pretty rigid uh, against the English interests in America. Uh, even though um, he had English roots, he didn't want the independence of the U.S. to be prevented by the British. So at the there was this thing called the Paris Treaty. And the Paris Treaty was in 1783. And at the time of the Paris Treaty, they had to determine the boundaries of the US and what was left of the English part of North America, later became Canada. And I think, um, well, it was an interesting thing. Uh, Benjamin Franklin really didn't know anything about Lake Superior, but he had to help determine the boundary of between Canada and the US. And this map that you see is one of the maps that was available. There weren't any accurate maps. And this map had a lot of fantasy in it because there's several islands it absolutely do not exist. Uh, Isle Royal is on there. And um, Benjamin Franklin was a clever guy who did things at the right time and got, got things done. And he was sitting at the table with these other dudes for to determine the boundaries. And of course, the English were on one side of the table and he was on the other side of the table. And so um, they talked about all these islands. Well, Benjamin Franklin had never been to the lake, so he didn't know really almost anything about it except what's on this map. But someone had told him that on Isle Royal, there was copper. And so the one thing you should do is try to get that. And so he made a deal with the other people at the table that they, that they could have three islands and we would have two islands. So we got Isle Royal in this thing called Philippo, which of course is a complete fantasy. <laughs> so, uh, and, and I don't know if Benjamin Franklin knew that, but he drew with them a boundary, which no one argued too much about. And I think the next slide shows the where the boundary <laughs> at. So, so that's how we got Isle Royal. And um, it's, that's a pretty cool thing. And it's only one of maybe four or five dozen amazing cool things that Ben Franklin did. 
he was a righteous dude. And uh, anyway, it, it, it makes a nice story. And if you, if you look at the story, you'll learn some other things about um, all of this. And hopefully, every, I think everyone should know this. Uh, how do we get our oil? It's Benjamin Franklin. And he didn't, <laughs> he didn't know squat about it. <laughs> and so in the chat, um, there's been a link post posted, which you might want to copy and just kind of store somewhere or um, because you can find it's a link to where the geo stories are. And so Bill's only going to be able to present a few of them. And if you're curious about learning more about the geo stories, you can you can see links to them in the blog. So shall we go to another question? Um, I think it, I think that might work. Um, I like this one because um, a lot of the students I had were exploration people, either for oil and gas or for some kind of minerals. And um, so I wanted to people to think about, it, it's a fantastic story about how the C&H conglomerate was uh, discovered. I mean, the C&H conglomerate is this magnificent conglomeratic rock that is infused with copper. And uh, it's so it's a sedimentary layer between many of the lava flows that up to 25 feet thick and up to maybe 15% copper. And um, so what's important about it is that the early copper that people found is all in fissures, which is a, just like a crack in the rock that was full up with copper. And, and so most of the early mines, like the cliff mine and the, um, mines around Copper Harbor and Mass City, the Minnesota mine, and they were all based on fissures. And they were the biggest fissures that people found. They found fissures everywhere. The copper stuck up out of the ground, and and uh, the Native Americans had found them all in the past and started mining thousands of years ago. They started pulling stuff from the fissures out, but but the mining industry that was developing here in the mid 1800s, they didn't want fissures anymore because all the fissures did is they had an investment, they sunk a shaft, and then after the shaft got a few hundred feet dip, deep, the fissure petered out and there was nothing left. So you get the mine all done, you get the infrastructure built with the tunnel and the lift, and, and then by the time you get that in structure and a few um, levels, done in the mine, that's it, you're done. And so they didn't want a ore like that. And so they wanted something that would sustain itself. And the CNH conglomerate is the unit that really made the copper district work, but it took a long time to discover it. So this is a story. And the question is about who discovered the great CNH conglomerate the rock formation that ran under Red Jack in Calumet and made copper mining profitable for decades. Well, and I don't know if you can see the um, responses, but 32% um, of the people have picked Ed Hurlbutt, only 14% picked Sam Hill, even less Billy Royal, uh, a little bit more, a wild boar at 15%, and then 35% are just not sure, so they've clicked all of the above. Yeah, well, in in the story we did, all, all of the above is right. Uh, <laughs> even, even a pig contributed. And um, so it's, let's see, this graphic, explains this kind of thing, uh, um, how the copper elephant got found, indigenous people, 
um, found veins and they dug pits. Pigs used the pits to keep warm. And then prospectors eventually stumble onto the pits kind of by accident. And uh, so that's what happened. Ed Hurled it, was a great fellow, um, but um, he had started working along uh, something which we call now the military road, which was a road that was built from Green Bay to Copper Harbor. And it was initiated during the Civil War, but it took 25 years to complete. And so they, they were still working on it in the 1860s. And Ed Hurlbut was organizing some local people to uh, cut down the trees and um, cut through the, um, the area of rocks and smooth the pavement. There was no pavement, of course, but smooth the gravel to have a military road that people could um, use to get across. And so they were constructing it in the Calumet region in this particular time. Um, well, um, they went every evening to roadhouses. And uh, so Billy Royal was the owner of the biggest and most popular roadhouse, which was located about where the Calumet High School is now. And, um, and, and that turns out to be at the high school, you can see some of the shafts of the C and to the C and H conglomerate. The C and H conglomerate went all the way from the high school all the way to the south um, toward what I call Millionaire Avenue. And, and it's down near the Osceola number 13 shaft. But um, these were all C and H shafts, and they they all started where the C and H conglomerate came to the surface. Well, Billy Royal didn't know anything about the C and H conglomerate, and Ed Hurlbut had collected rocks up in the region around um, the Cliff Mine that were part of the conglomerate layer, which was located uh, just underneath the, where the Greenstone flow is, the largest flow in the district. So he had found a few, and, and he told all the guys that were working on the military road to let him know every time they found a rock that looks like this. And so they had been looking and looking at this kind of thing. And, and so, um, Another man who worked with Ed Hurlbut is a man named Sam Hill. And uh, Sam Hill was a legendary fellow because he could swear like a trooper. So his stories got retold with all the dirty words in them. All the men loved this. It was a men's world in those days. So um, anyway, um, Sam Hill, was one of the people working with Ed Hurlbut and a, a real buddy, kind of an aristocrat like Ed Hurlbut. They came from richer families and and so on. And Sam Hill was a big fellow with a, a lot to say. Isn't All there that. isn't there a phrase, what the Sam Hill? That's right. And it originated because of this guy. <laughs> uh, th th this thing, what the Sam Hill are you doing? Uh, or something like that. Uh, that's right. This is the guy I came from. So he's a legendary fellow uh, with a Copper Country history. And Sam Hill is known actually all over the country, probably all over the world, but because of that phrase, what in the Sam Hill are you doing? So he, <laughs> caught, he caught a lot of people's attention. So I want you to imagine some evening when all the workers and um, and um, Ed Hurlbut and Sam Hill uh, were in the tavern, which was operated by a Billy Royal. And Billy Royal is, he's kind of like me, he's in, get, getting old and 
he's overweight and he can barely move around and but he makes a living on pork sandwiches and uh and beer has plenty of beer he also has some women that come and they help with the business and um so he f- likes to fill up the ha- the roadhouse every evening and give people pork sandwiches and beer and charge them a lot and uh, but he's running out of energy so um and one of the things that happened is he, he raised the pigs in the back of the of the building but the pigs kept disappearing and he f- he f- found out and saw one day that there was a big boar that came and busted down the fence and and the little piggies all escaped and so so when Sam Hill and Ed Hurlbut came into the tavern that night he tried to convince them to go and get that um boar and shoot it so that he wouldn't have this trouble again and and Ed Hurlbut was not in a position to do that he could barely get to the to the pig pen so um anyway they went out and um with their guns and uh traveled actually not very far and got to this place where there was a pit the pit was an old native american pit that was dug and it happened to be dug just at the place where the c and h conglomerate was but what they found was that the pigs were all in this trench it was winter and it was cold and they seemed to use the trench as a place to huddle together and keep warm and so that's why the little piggies always went there so ed and sam hill we're not sure which one shot but one of them shot the pig and so they they killed the the wild boar and um, so that was pretty cool and then they sent out some of the men to retrieve the boar and carry him back to the kitchen, such as it was in the tavern. But on the way, some of these men that knew what C and H conglomerate looked like noticed the rocks that were around the piggies in the trench. And they brought back some of those. And this, sure enough, was the C and H conglomerate. So it turned out that this particular trench was just in the right pace, place. The pigs picked it, and Ed and Sam Hill shot the boar, which uncovered uh, where it was. And so you see how all those people were involved in the C and H. Eventually, the C and H conglomerate was sold by Ed Holbert to uh, the C and H company. And it was the layer that sustained the whole district and which extended all the way under Red Jacket, which you can see in the distance in this particular slide. So it's a story I like. And one of the morals of this story, I think applies a lot and geologists know this. And that is a lot of times things that get discovered, get discovered for funny reasons not quite straight science. That's what I like about geology is it isn't rigid. And sometimes when you're outside, the luck of being outside is what causes you to do something productive. And the other advantage we have is that the companies have figured out who else to pay for information like where are you going to dig the drill hole or where are you going to dig the trench or where are you going to sink the shaft or where are you going to explore and so they pay the geologists to do it and sometimes we decide without enough data because it's expensive to get data 
And so we have to imagine. And we have to see things like that are around us that have nothing to do with geology. What do the pigs have to do with geology? Not very much, but they have a little geo heritage. And so we celebrate it. Anyway, that's, <laughs> that's one of my favorite stories. Um, it, it's probably not completely true because I've read several versions of it and they're always a little bit different. And so I bet the listeners have heard the story in some form or another too. And they probably have differences. So that's one of the fun about these stories is that they're only partly true. <laughs> um, and you have to kind of fill in the blanks and imagine uh, what was happening. So I had fun with this one. That's a good story. I've heard your own twist on it already. You're evolving the story too. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have time for one more story? Sure. Um, should we go to the next set of questions? This or uh, Tommy Knockers or which other one? Or Agassi. We could do the Tommy Knockers. Okay. All right. This is a fun one. What are Tommyknockers is the question. Halloween characters, gremlins, as in Houghton gremlins, leprechauns, mine creatures who eat pasty handles, or Cornish superstitions. And our audience is voting away and Cornish superstitions is a, a, a majority favorite. And some people think it might be mind creatures who eat pasty handles. <laughs> <laughs> A couple, 10% in there with the Houghton gremlins. <laughs> well, yeah, I think I think Cornish superstitions is as good an answer as any because it certainly comes from the Cornish heritage of our miners. And uh, but each of these choices. Um, are, you, you know, they, they have some merit. I, I like D, the mind creatures who eat pasty handles, because that tells a lot of the story of Tommy knockers. They were also called knockers. And it seems like in the copper country, they're maybe more commonly called knockers. But um, yeah, here's some. Uh, Here's some pictures of things that I found. Um, these were little guys that were in the cracks of the mine and kind of like leprechauns. Um, and they maybe they have the same origin as leprechauns, little uh, guys that you deal with. And the, the routine of the Tommyknocker is that he wanted something to eat from you. And the miners ate pasties, and the pasties um, would get dirty from their hands, and especially the handles of the pasties. And so they would throw the handles down in the cracks of the mine. And this uh, placated the knockers and kept them from doing little mischief. And some of the mischief they, they did is they get blamed for when a rock falls on a miner. And uh, that, I mean, that's a serious kind of thing. So they're almost, uh, well, almost bad guys, um, but very superstitious. Uh, uh, I read that half of the miners believed in the knockers and the other half didn't. And so people would make fun of each other uh, about this, but, they come and they go back centuries, back until at least 500 AD in Europe and in mostly Celtic kinds of countries. There are um, stories about 
And the knockers are the particular kind that are in mines, but there are other kinds of features. In Houghton, um, they were talked about quite a bit. And when boats started coming into Houghton, uh, they were said to have little creatures in the bilges of the boats. Uh, only they didn't call them knockers, they called them gremlins. And so um, I'm not sure about this, but I'm thinking that the fact that we have a, a football and hockey team called the Houghton Gremlins here in Houghton uh, probably takes its roots to the time when little guys were in the boats, or at least people thought little guys were in the boats uh, here in um, here in Houghton. So, uh, um, Tommy Knockers, th this was carried, the Cornish spread their culture, of course, everywhere. Uh, there was a, there was a pub in Mohawk called the Bucket of Blood. And uh, it was originated from a, a pub that was in Cornwall where one day they they didn't have running water. They put a bucket down the, the well and they brought it back up and it was blood-like. And so this caused them to change the name of the pub to the Bucket of Blood. And the Bucket of Blood went with the Cornish mining community all over North America. So there's there's one in Virginia City, there's one in Butte, and there's one in, um, what's a place in Colorado? Um, anyway, um, one of the Colorado mining towns. And uh, so probably, there are probably more of them. And uh, so the, the, the Cornish spread not only the pasty, but knockers and Tommy knockers and the bucket of blood pub. And so um, it's a wonderful thing to celebrate and a, a, a very interesting and fun part, I, th I think, of our geo heritage. So what, what made the water red? Yeah. Well, I think they thought it was blood. So maybe there was something that went down in the well and contaminated it. Mm. And, you know, it's for all of us to wonder, isn't it? It's like all these things, Tommy knockers. Do you believe there's Tommy knockers? Hmm? Maybe there was iron. <laughs> I don't oh, know. That's, that's right, but that's not as much fun. <laughs> Oh, so one more story, or do you want to go to Q&A? There's some um, lots and lots of questions. Or I want to remind the audience, you can ask questions by typing in the Q&A. Um, we are going to go long. I decided ahead of time we were going to be going long tonight. So um, we're going to definitely make sure we have time for Q&A. Um, and so... <laughs> um, there uh, is a question in the Q&A asking about if you could tell the story of the Ontonagon boulder. <laughs> so there's there's that story that yes. is part of the Q&A. I haven't, I haven't finished that yet, but it's one of the ones on my, on my list. So it's a wonderful story and uh, well worth uh, telling. I, I, I did do a story on the uh, something that's like the Antonagon boulder, and it's called the Green Rock. And um, the Green Rock is a vein of Chrysocolla. Chrysocolla is a beautiful turquoise colored mineral. And uh, it's abundant, especially along the North Shore of the Keweenaw. It fills lots of the vesicles of the lavas and and at Copper Harbor, right by the lighthouse, there is a vein, which is about a foot thick when it crosses up the shore, but it, it widens and gets three or four feet thick when it goes into the water. And um, the 
story about the um, green vein, Le Roche Vert, the French version of it was what was made famous. Of course, the Native Americans found it first, but but the voyageurs who were very much the leading European people in the 1700s, they advanced the story of the green rock because the vein could be seen through the Lake Superior water. And so if the sun was just the right way, you'd be paddling along the shore, which they always did. There were many white veins. Those are all calcite veins, but there weren't many turquoise veins. And so um, the voyageur called it uh, the green rock. And the, so the green rock became famous in legendary history. Um, it may have been exaggerated by the voyageur. The voyageurs were kind of low life people. They uh, exploited everything. And um, um, so they weren't always the greatest contributions. They contributed some wonderful music because they played Celtic um, sort of music and, um, and they um, killed lots and lots and lots of animals. They ran the fur trade and worked with the Hudson Bay Company. And, and so they pillaged the whole area. And, but they would follow the shorelines along. And so they, they found these, these veins. And so part of the legend of that. So you can still go and visit the Green Rock. And you can still find the remnants of the vein. But it's been so deeply plundered by mostly by European people since uh, Copper Harbor started and so on. They uh, tried to extend the Green Rock vein into the mainland and they tried uh, mining right in Copper Harbor itself. And there's lots of fishers in the Copper Harbor area. But they loved the Green Rock and so they went and chipped it away. And, so there's not so much of it left. It's not in the glory that it once had, but, and maybe it was exaggerated anyway, but anyway, that's a story that um, you also can review about um, the Green Rock and um, the Voyager, another part of our history and what drove them. I think they knew that it had something to do with copper. And so uh, they knew that it would help them in some way to keep, um, keep thinking about um, the shorelines of Lake Superior, which was kind of controlled by the Voyageur. They had camps. One was at Sault Ste. Marie. Another one was at Grand Portage. Minnesota. And, and so they became, they grew into the, into, uh, well, I wouldn't say cities, neither one of them is really a big city, but now, but they were the early places where people collected. And so they were important in the culture, cultural development of the region. And they were driven in part by uh, rocks. So, well, there's there's several questions out there, um, but um, there's a, a bunch in the category of gratefulness. So I just want to read. Here's one from Robert. Hello, Bill. It's Robert um, Buchler. I was in your volcanology class in March of 1980 when Mont St. Helens erupted. You left us in the hand hands of your assistant. When you got back, you gave us an update of your trip to, to Mount St. Helens. I enjoyed your class tremendously. Thank you. Great. That's nice to hear. And did you learn anything from your trip to Mount St. Helens? Well, you know what happened on that trip, and um, most of the people listening now are, you know, 
executives or professors or or uh, geophysicists or you know yeah I mean you're way beyond the level of a student and so but you realize that to do anything in geology let alone volcanology which is a pretty obscure part of the discipline it requires money and so you've got to go looking for funding well at Mount St. Helens I worked there for three or four years in part part time I would go off in the summers and um work there and stuff so I was a extra employee but but the rules there were different than I've ever had before or since and that is you know because of the media attention that came we were on the tv news almost every night for a while especially during that first year and so the head of the u.s geological survey told us spend all the money that you want or that you need <laughs> and i've never had that happen <laughs> so that was one of the really good things that happened in that and the effect of that went on for years volcanology became more respectable it became part of geology which it really wasn't before it was a bunch of people kind of running around and taking first looks observational looks at things but it be it became a science and um a lot of people did it and they could get funding from normal sources like the National Science Foundation. Uh, it was much, much easier to get it because of the attention that Mount St. Helens gave us. I mean, we learned a lot. It was a, the first time I ever worked in a group of 80 scientists who mm -hmm. actually communicated to each other. You know, before that, we were kind of lone wolves. and. Um, so it was a lot of good things that happened as a result of it. It defined my career a lot, um, focused it. And, you know, so really good thing. Erica, do you see a question you'd like to pull out? Um, there's a couple of questions, but I, I did want to read something from Barbara that says, this isn't a question, uh, rather a comment in a sharing of gratitude. And she says that Anishinaabe peoples have stories and teachings of little people as well. And she says, Dr. Rose, I was a student of yours, graduated in 1981 with a Bachelor of Science in Geological Engineering, fond memories and much appreciation for all that you taught and continue to teach. I now live in Ontario and I'm a professor at Trent University in the Indigenous Environmental Studies and Sciences program um, and has left some contact details. Some of my work focuses on Anishinaabe water teachings and practices and copper. And so she had to sign off but said Mikwich uh, for sharing these stories. So I wanted to share that um, with you. And so, so let me let me say something about that question because uh, I, I would really like to know much more about Anishinaabe stories. And I've read some of them. And uh, but one of the things I feel is I feel hesitant about telling their stories. Mm -hmm. And um, it's just it's just like, you know, because I'm not a member of the tribe, I'm very hesitant to read something about a story and then try to tell it. And and the the main reason is that stories are stories they aren't written down and they evolve and so if you have a written down version of it i'm afraid that it isn't reflecting the most recent changes i mean i used to do this when i was a little boy i we spent a lot of time outside and my father would build a campfire and we'd tell stories around the campfire. My father told lots and lots and lots of stories, but they were never the same. Even though the basic crux of it was the same, he changed it all the time. And I, I think that's a wonderful thing 
because you can change things and put in uh, things from your recent experience that relate to the older version of the story. We should let these stories evolve. It's part of what we've lost. It's oral history and oral history is a lie. It's not some 15th great grandmother's version of something. It's the 15th great grandmother's version plus all the other grandmothers that go since that have told that story around a fire. And they they all changed it and they should change it. So uh, anyway, I really appreciate what Erica does because she works a lot with Native Americans. And so I try to learn a little bit by osmosis because I'm not as mobile as she is and, and, and to get ideas about that. But, but the other thing,